let's move on just briefly on EGFR exon 20 mutations. Luda, I'm so confused. Exon 20 mutations. These are not exon 19 and 21. They don't seem to be as sensitive to TKIs as the 19 and 21s. They're challenging to treat and to make things even more complicated. There's all these new therapies that have come out trying to um, treat these to try to offer uh, or test um, uh, in the Exxon 20 patient population. Can you briefly walk us through some of these trials and some of the strategies that are ongoing? Sure. So um, we just finished discussing um, our data on what we call the EGFR sensitizing mutation. So in EGFR pathway, the type of mutation matters. Um, if you look at all EGFR mutations, you can divide them into the sensitizing mutation, which is your traditional deletion 19, um, L858R. Um, you can also look at the atypical mutations, which are mutation in exon 18 in general. And then you have mutations in exon 20. Um, and mutations in exon 20 that you might be familiar with is T790M point mutation, which is also in exon 20. But what we now have with emerging data on some ability to drug that mutation is EGFR exon 20 insertion. So when you look at the molecular pathology report, the phrase EGFR mutation detected is no longer valuable. So you got to know what EGFR mutation was detected to make your decisions. As Ben correctly pointed out, traditional EGFR TKI, both first generation and second generation, usually have minimal activity in patients with EGFR exon 20 insertions, with response rate of single digits about 3 to 8%, and median PFS of about 2 to 2.9 months. Pretty much at the first restaging, um, the patient will progress. So at ASCO, they have um, updated us on three compounds. One of them is called Amivantanab. It's easier for me to call it JNJ372, and I'll continue to do it for the duration of the talk. So JNJ372 is a bispecific antibody against EGFR and MET. The way we think it works, um, it inhibits the signaling through the EGFR receptor and then down modulates the receptor and also some, uh, uh, creates some immune directed anti tumor activity. So, it was a large study, and cohort D of that study specifically looked at EGFR exon 20 insertions. So, overall, about 2% of your patients will have an EGFR exon 20 insertion. So, it's a pretty sizable population, very similar to what you expect for the RAT or ROS or MET. Um, small number of patients in that cohort, only 50, uh, 39 were response valuable. Um, majority of the patients were previously treated with platinum doublet, so that's a second line and above study. Um, and overall response rate was 36%, so much better than what we would expect from a traditional EGFR TKI. Um, the clinical benefit rate was about 67%. Um, the responses were durable, um, about 10 months median duration of response. Um, and toxicities were actually pretty good. Uh, majority of the toxicities were grade one and two, and majority of the toxicities are infusion reactions, which we would expect with antibodies, um, rash and paronychia, and there were almost no grade three toxicities. And currently this drug has an FDA breakthrough designation for patients with exon uh, 20 insertions, EGF exon 20 insertions. So the second drug that was presented is um, osimertinib, so from the Acrin, ECOG Acrin 5162 study, the reason why osimertinib um, rise to our desire to study it is because uh, we believe that one of the reasons why the first and second generation TKI did not work is because we cannot bring up the dose high enough to inhibit the receptor without running into our traditional EGFR toxicity. Since osimertinib is definitely better tolerated than um, your first and second EGFR TKI, the idea was to give osimertinib at a higher dose, at 160 milligrams, and see if that um, has an ability to inhibit EGFR exon 20 uh, insertions. And the results were kind of mediocre in my view. So um, only 15 patients were looked at, uh, second line and above. Overall response, 24%. Uh, disease control rate is 82%. And median PFS of 9.6. And toxicities, as we know from Bloop study, um, using 160 milligrams is still very tolerable. And toxicities were 
as expected without um, many great free text studies. So a um, little bit less effective than uh, JNJ372, but certainly more effective than uh, traditional um, EGFR TKI. Um, and then the last one is my um, abstract that get my um, uh, most disappointing abstract of ASCA um, title. Um, this is Poziatnip, um, looked at 115 patients, uh, second line and above, EGFR exon 20, overall response um, 14%, uh, disease control rate 68, median PFS four months, 25% grade three diarrhea, and grade three diarrhea is something that really not compatible with life, in my opinion. 28% um, grade three rash and 9% grade three stomatitis. And grade three stomatitis is your patient is unable to eat. Um, so I think to me, this is really, I don't think has um, a place in a current dose um, in a patient with EGFR exon 20 insertion. What was interesting in that uh, abstract that they actually saw that the efficacy of poziotomy depends on where your insertion was and near loop insertions did better than uh, far loop and helical insertions. So I think eventually we might even subdivide those EGFR exertion, um, insertion patients uh, more. Um, even though it wasn't assigned to me, but I think we cannot talk about the EGFR exon 20 insertions without mentioning TAC-788, which is MOBA-certainty. Um, the last time we heard update on that trial was ASCA-19. Um, which show it's, a, it's also a GFR TKI, but differently designed, which showed response rate of 43%. So right now for the EGFR exon 20 insertion, I think our two front runners are J&J 372 and TAC 788. Both of them actually have FDA breakthrough designation for that disease.